Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack. So, high resolution. What does that really mean? Today we have HD, 4K, 8K and ever onwards and upwards. We're at the point now where screen technology is so good that an individual pixel is, to all intents and purposes, invisible to the naked eye. Personal computing, CPUs and graphics cards are at a point where we have real-time ray tracing at speeds faster than the average monitor can keep up with in resolutions higher than the human eye can perceive. And that's really great for modern gaming, where the strive for realism and immersion is and always has been pushing those boundaries. But there was a time in personal computing when high res meant simply that you were not dealing with whole characters but could individually address a pixel on a screen. We also saw an imbalance appear between a computer's ability to drive out higher resolutions and the ability of our old CRT TVs of the time to display those resolutions, leading to high resolution monitors, specifically designed to provide those display modes that our poor old Trinitrons simply couldn't handle. This tipping point was around the mid to late 80s and the increase in the number and variety of PC graphics cards and all of this started to come at a cost. By 1991, the likes of the VGA Wonder XL were offering Visa 32K colour depth and a maximum display resolution of 800 by 600 at 60Hz. Prices ranged up to a whopping 400 for the 1MB RAM option and that card wouldn't work on your telly. Compare the price of that card to an Amiga 1200 at the time and you can see the start of the PC gaming versus console and home computer debate, which still go on today. Hop into any high-end gaming forum and say either my PC graphics are better than the PS5 or vice versa and then sit back and watch the fireworks. Anyway, as you may know, if you're a regular viewer of the channel, I had an Atari 520 STFM in around 1986 and quite happily plugged it into my telly and had great fun playing all of the games, doing some programming and even attempting to write a sitcom. It was dreadful. But one thing that always bothered me about my Atari was this elusive high res mode that no matter what I did, I couldn't activate. After a chat with a chap in the local computer shop, I was told that in order to get high resolution graphics out of my Atari ST, I'd need a high resolution monitor and it would cost me a further arm and half a leg. Money I instead spent on moving, I won't say upgrading, to an Amiga 500. Now a very nice chap called Chris made a very generous donation a few weeks ago. A couple of Atari STs in need of repair and not one but two original Atari SM124 monitors. One of which we think is in working order presumably the one with both cables still attached, so we'll start there and use the other for spares if we have to. We'll see if it works, give it a good clean up and then we can take a look at what I've been missing all these years. I'm going to start with a really good wipe down with antibacterial wipes as I found these do shift a lot of surface dirt and will hopefully leave only the really stubborn bits to clean up. Some of the more stubborn stains did need some IPA and one of these very, very low abrasion pads. Well, after using about 30 or so wipes over a half hour period, we've got a pile of dirty wipes and a monitor that looks a lot cleaner. Happy days. I'll clean the cable too as we don't want a lovely clean monitor with a tatty tail. So now we'll take a little look inside to check the state of the internals. This thing hasn't been powered up in a long time so we shouldn't need to discharge the anode but if there are any adjustments we need to do we'll make sure to do that. Please take heed of this warning, don't mess about with CRT monitors unless you know what you're doing. CRT anodes can release a very high voltage and this of course can be fatal. I, I take no responsibility for your poking about inside electrical devices but of course I want you all to be safe so if you're in any doubt please don't do it yourself, take it to a professional. None of the capacitors inside are leaking or bulging but I'll still probably replace them as soon as I've got some in stock. 
and these knobs will need a good clean and they're also going to need retro brighting when the weather is a little nicer. So my thinking is that if I've got to wait for capacitors for the preventative maintenance and the weather for cosmetics, with things looking okay on the inside, we should just go ahead and attach this monitor to our ST and see if it works as it is. And it does. That flickering you're seeing is of course not visible to the naked eye and it's due to the camera refresh being out of phase with the screen refresh rate. But here in the shack I can tell you that the screen looks incredibly clear and sharp. It really is very nice indeed. Well after 35 years I get to see this preferences screen with my own eyes, showing ST high as my resolution. Nice. But why in high res am I limited to black and white? Well, chucking stuff up on the screen requires memory in the computer to store it, and there's always a finite amount of that. Now this Atari ST monochrome screen is 640 pixels across by 400 pixels down, so that's 256,000 bits of information. Divide that by 8 to get 32,000 bytes, or 32K, which is how much screen memory the Atari ST has. Now, if we want to add in some colour, we need to use more bits to define the pixels. For example, if we need four colours on our screen, we need to use two bits to store that colour information, 0, 1, 2, 3. In order to accommodate that extra colour information in the 32K screen memory, the resolution needs to come down to make room. So the Atari's medium resolution is 640 by 200 at two bits per pixel, magically still 256,000 bits, 32,000 bytes or 32K. For low resolution of 16 colours, we need four bits of information, 320 by 200 times four and still magically 256,000 bits, 32,000 bytes or 32K. Machines such as the ZX Spectrum approach things slightly differently, instead storing colour information in a separate memory space and overlaying it on the screen pixel information. So the Spectrum therefore used 256 by 192 pixels around 6K and then a further 768 bytes for the 32 by 24 character colour information. That meant for each 8x8 eight eight pixel character on the screen, a single foreground colour and a single background colour were stored. But that meant every on pixel in the 8x8 eight eight space would have the foreground colour and every off pixel would have the background colour, hence the famous spectrum colour clash. Although this wasn't only a spectrum issue, as can be seen here on the MSX and C64 machines also. So with that in mind, it's entirely possible to convert a 16 color low resolution image to a high resolution monochrome image by choosing a dithering pattern for the four pixels you get to represent only one pixel on a color screen. Because you can have 16 combinations of on off pixels in a four pixel space, see, clever. Anyway, that means you still get to enjoy your color games on a monochrome high res screen, as long as the developers supported that option. And some did. The list of games with monochrome support is perhaps unsurprisingly not very long, but there are some classics in that list. But it's the more serious side of things that really make this mono mode stand out. Cubase was almost the de facto standard ST music software, and who knows, if I'd used first word plus, perhaps my screenplay wouldn't have sucked so much. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this little monitor, and it is little, only 12 inches diagonal, it's certainly been fun to play with, and it's certainly got me thinking about getting a Yamaha DX7 and having a pop at creating some original 80s tunes for the channel, all on the old equipment from back in the day. As always, thanks for watching, and if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notification of new content. We'd also love your support either through Patreon or through Ko-Fi if you appreciate what we do and are in a position to help. If you'd like to donate something to the shack, drop us an email. Please leave your comments below as we always love to read them and until next time in the Retro Shack, it's goodbye from me.